Hi students, it's uh, Tuesday. Uh, it's actually the 24th, um, last day this week. I'm putting together this video so it's ready to go for next week. Um, I'm hoping you have a, a good Thanksgiving. Hopefully you are safe. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. Uh, I wanna go through this little PowerPoint, this presentation. Um, So yesterday I had you uh, watch a video and the video was about the Castlegate mine disaster. The day before I had you do the Schofield mine disaster. Um, but I wanna talk specifically about the Castlegate mine disaster today. And the reason why I wanna do that is because I want you to understand the importance of mining in Utah, how it it becomes such a big job creator. But also with these disasters, what's going to happen is we're going to lose a lot of the immigrants, a lot of the immigrants that are coming to Utah to try and start a new life. And I think that's a sad thing that happens. So let's talk about Castlegate. It happens in March of 1924. Um, it ends up being the second largest mine disaster in Utah history. Um, the only one that's larger is the Schofield mine disaster. And that one killed 200 miners. This kills 171, I think, something like that. Um, it's the 10th largest mine disaster in the United States history. So it's a pretty big deal. Okay, um, I'm gonna read the paper. Yeah, 171 miners died on this day, March 8th, 1924. So pretty big deal. Now Castlegate is down in Carbon County, which is near Price, Utah. So if you've ever been to Price, Utah, or you've driven down like towards Moab or down that way, you, you probably have driven through this canyon. And I put this picture up because I wanted you to see the reason why they called it Castle Gate is because the way this canyon is formed, it's like it has the walls of a canyon or a, a walls of a castle on both sides. Uh, it's just, it's really spectacular. It really is. Okay. This is a coal mine. And obviously with a coal mine, what they're doing is they are taking out the coal, which is this black rock. And when they start to chip away that black rock, there's a couple things that are left over. One, gases. And there's lots of gases down in this, right? So when this organic materi material starts to form, it's gonna leave off gases. And so when the miners start to chip away the rock, those gases are gonna be uh, left over. And that's gonna be very detrimental, bad for the miners. Um, it can cause explosions. Um, it can get up in your nose and, and uh, burn your lungs and kill you. Um, so these people would take canaries down into uh, the mines in um, cages. And if the canary died, uh, then they knew that there was gases and they had to get out and they had to get out quick. Now, the other thing that was left over when they start to chip out this rock is uh, this coal dust. They actually called it coal damp. Um, these were huge mines. Um, the tunnels were huge. They, they would take mules and horses down with these carts um, and bring out the coal from down in. And this particular mine was 7,000 feet down. Um, it's about a mile and a half in that they were down in uh, chipping away uh, this rock, leaving this dust and, and gases around, okay? Um, I was able to just Google online and find the picture of this coal damp. Um, again, uh, very, very explosive. Now, yesterday in the story, it explained that every night before the shift would get done, their job was to take the hose and just spray down this cold damp 
so that it wouldn't fluff up and cause any problems. Well, the shift the night before had not done that, okay? So every morning before the, the morning shift would start, the fire boss would go down and he would check to make sure that there wasn't any gas in the chambers. Now, one of the problems is this is a time period before there was electricity, be excuse me, before batteries. There was electricity, there just wasn't batteries. So the only way the, the miners would be able to see were with these carbide lamps. And these lamps had an oil uh, filament with an oil uh, contain, right? And then it would be an open flame. Well, the story goes that the fire boss was down inside the tunnel and his carbide lamp went out. He was checking for gas. His carbide lamp went out. He went to reset the, the carbide lamp to relight it. And that caused the first explosion. Um, you can imagine the damage. Uh, there's this cold damp everywhere. Remember the cold damp is this dust that's uh, around. It usually is covered with water to make sure that it's not puffing up and, and causing trouble. But the shift the night before didn't do that. Um, and so um, what happens is this huge explosion, which actually blows um, the gates off the front of the, the mine. It tangles the rails inside, the railroad rails inside. And um, you can imagine if there's this explosion, the force of the explosion has to go out. And at the same time that this explosion happens, the other miners are actually entering the mine uh, to start their shift. And the story goes that they had their lamps also blown out. You can imagine this big explosion just going past um, almost like a, a wind storm, right? Just right by him and their lights were blown out too um, as the miners started to try to reset their lights cold damp and gases were in the air and there was a third explosion uh, excuse me second explosion and then a, eventually a third explosion um, it talks about the aftermath um, that there was carts and these rails were tangled um, it just it just was a mess and of course 171 miners were killed uh, between the three explosions um, nearly instantly again the story that you read yesterday talks about that this was a violent fiery explosion most of the miners um, they were not recognizable um, in fact, it says that some of the miners were so burned that they could only recognize the miner because of the article of clothing. Um, if you can imagine, right, they're looking at the body and they say, the only way I know this is John is because he wore these types of boots. And so that was, that was it, right? Um, again, they would have these gates down inside and the, the gates... Um, were blown off, uh, literally blown off. It says that, that the gates were blown a mile across the canyon. Um, this is the part that I think is the most sad, right? Is um, this leaves, uh, let me get the numbers, uh, 415 widows and orphan children behind. Um, 171 men killed on that day um it's just devastating it's devastating um i want to share another thing with you this is this is actually um let me see if i can get to the right page <laughs> sorry I can make sure I get to the right page. I don't know if I have it up or not. Oh, I do. Hold on. So I'm going to go back. I'm sorry. This is not very good. This is a page that shows all the names of the miners that died that day. 
uh, March 8, 1924, again, uh, devastating. They actually were able to put together a list of all the miners using the death certificates that were provided by the um, state of Utah. And then they were put in order of last name. Um, they used the information from the death certificates to be able to tell where they were born, if they were married, who their parents were. Um, and so the reason why I want to show you this is because it starts for us to understand all these people that had come from other countries to live the American dream. Okay. So you have these people from Italy, from Wales, from Greece, more Italians. You have a couple of Americans here, right? Murray and Spanish Fork. Um, Again, in the story yesterday when you read, it talked about all the different people that came over. I think it's always interesting to see uh, these people from Greece, for example. They know how old they are, but they don't know when their birthday was. They don't know exactly what day they were born. And I've always had students in my class ask me why, why they don't know. And it's because the countries never gave um, them birth certificate. They never they then never wrote that down. The only way they would know if they, when they were born is if their mother actually wrote their birth date in the front of their family Bible. And so some of these people, even though um, they're from Greece or from Italy, they, they don't know exactly when their birth date was. I'm just gonna kind of go slow through this because I, I want you to get, um, kind of get into this and kind of understand this. Again, this middle column right here is showing um, where they are from. Here's a guy from Japanese, from Japan, sorry. A um, couple more Greeks, right? Kanakakis, uh, Kapas, Karosis, right? Um, the one I want you to sh show you is this last name Morrison. So we get down here and we have the Morrisons. And again, they're listed alphabetically. But we have Daniel McNair Morrison. Um, in 1905, he would have been 19 years old. And then we have James Morrison. And in 1907, he would have been um, 17. Okay, so 17 and 19. You can look over here and see who their parents are. So you know they are brothers, okay? William Watt Morrison Sr. William Watt Morrison Sr. is the dad. So you go back here and you have the dad. So you have the dad that died and his son that was 17 and his son that was 19. Okay. You look over here and the mom's name was Margaret. Her maiden name was McNair. And I can imagine old Margaret was pretty sad that day. She probably sent her kids off, her husband off. They probably ate breakfast together, had some coffee, right? And sent them off. And then with the th explosions, I'm sure they realized how devastating, she realized how devastating it was and that probably her parents were never, her, her, her husband and son were not coming home. Now I've done a little bit of research about this particular one, this one, because I want you to scroll down here. I'm gonna show you this one. I'm gonna put it in a little bigger. See if I can get it to go bigger, okay? Um, it's this one right here, okay? Now I know you, you paid attention enough to know that my last name is Pollock. Well, William Wallace Pollock was actually my great grandfather and he died in this mine explosion in 1924. My grandfather, so his son, his name is Devere, and Devere was 12 years old in 1924. So I want you to imagine, I know a lot of you are 12 or 13 years old, maybe a little older, but I want you to imagine that you just lost your father in a mine explosion, and you look around the room and you see seven little brothers and sisters, you're 12 years old, and your mom is in the kitchen crying because the dad has died, okay? My great grandma, her name was Zina. This is her right here, okay? Again, 
I never met my grandpa, William Wallace. They called him Wally, William Wallace Pollock. Um, he was actually a farmer and he was supposed to go back to the farms in the, in the summer and work in the farms. But he had just gone with a couple other friends and, and uh, brother-in-laws. Here's a Rebecca Pollock down here that was married to Charles Quilter. So they all went and got their jobs in the mines just to work during the winter, just long enough so they could have some income coming in. And then they were going to go back to the farms. And unfortunately for him, uh, he didn't make it. They had this big explosion in March, right? It's near the spring towards the end of the winter. So he was really close to making it. So, um, please fill out the worksheet as you go through. Um, sometimes when we talk about our, our history, it gets a little personal. Um, but William Wallace Pollock was one of the victims, one of the miners that died um, in the Castlegate mine disaster of 1924.